Hello everyone, welcome to Saw Dialogues 2022, presented by Art and Market in partnership with National Arts Council Singapore, as part of the 10th edition of Singapore Art Week. My name is Vivian Yeo, and I am content producer at Art and Market. It is great to have you all with us at Gilman Barracks, and to those of you joining us online on our live stream, welcome. On the, QR, uh, on the screen now is a QR code that you can scan to access Slido for the Q&A segment. Feel free to type in a question at any time, and we will get to as many questions as possible at the end of the talk. If you are attending this online, you can also turn on the automatic live caption function by clicking on the CC button on your video player. Without further ado, I would now like to introduce the talk for this afternoon, titled a and Generation Gap, Artist-Run Spaces. What does it take to keep an artist-run space going? The speakers talk about the opportunities that come with operating an independent space, observations of the art scenes in which they work, as well as best practices and perennial challenges. The panel will be moderated by Ian T, Associate Editor at Art & Market. Ian, over to you. All right, thank you, Vivian, for the introduction. And thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. I'm very excited that we have uh, three speakers who are joining us today who are all respective artists in their own right, and they also run independent spaces in the localities they are based in. So with me in Singapore right now, we have Moses Tan, who founded a, an independent art space called Stach. And joining us online, we have Hatao, from Hanoi, and she is the managing editor and program coordinator of Matka. And finally, we also have Nindit Yu, who is joining us from Indonesia. Nindit Yu is the co-founder of Simati Art House. Um, so let's just start the conversation. I think I would go according to um, starting with the younger space first. So Moses. You opened a space called Stutch in 2020, and it's such an interesting name for a space, firstly. And so could you tell us a little bit more about the space, as well as your role? Hello, yes. So um, I'm Moses, I'm running Stutch, and actually just to sort of explain why the name came about, um, it was actually a conversation I had with my partner and I misheard a word. And I said, oh, Stutch sounds cool, let's, let's use it. And I thought like Stutch itself, carbohydrates would be interesting to think about giving energy and how about giving energy in the arts is through conversations, for example, etc. cetera. Um, so, um, sorry, what was the question again? Uh? Um, what's your role at Stutch and what are your motivations for opening such a space? Okay, so like my role, I call it an enabler. Um, in the sense that I think like, also the, the origins of the term was because I was having this conversation with um, a co-curator, Shireen, uh, and we were talking about our first project and she asked, you know, what's our role in this project? Like, are we managers, are we curators? And I think like, um, I want to keep it very flexible and that we were thinking of a very ambiguous way of thinking about it just so that we can like sort of swap out or change out ex our agencies if we ever need to. So instead of that, so we decided to use the word enabler just so that we can sort of shift between like curating, managing, even like sometimes acting as an artist in a way. So as, at Starch itself, what I do is I tend to just shift between different roles from managing a show down to like um, sort of just even managing the space and at times even just being very like, hands off and passing the key to the artist or using it for the month. So that's basically what I do with Starch. All right, and I'd like to also, at this point, um, ask Hatao for you to introduce Matka. And it's a space that among the three of your spaces, it's a little bit different because Matka started out as, um, you could describe it as a digitally native um, place. So could you talk a little bit about how, um, how it was like when Matka started in the mid-2010s? Um, hi, yeah. uh, thank you for your question. Um, so briefly, uh, Matka is a uh, multi-platform initiative dedicated to photography. Uh, we are based in Hanoi, Vietnam, and uh, you know we are run of um, uh, we are a team, small team of working photographers, um, trying to do you know a project dedicated to the medium of photography, um, simply because uh, we weren't seeing anything that you know supports the local creatives here. Um, as Ian said, um, we started out as digital native, um, simply because you know it's the most practical thing to do when you started out, right? Uh, because you know running a website doesn't require as much resources 
at first, uh, of course, you know, running it uh, for years is a different story. Um, and in 2019, which is two years ago, um, we have this physical um, space. Uh, I would consider it an expansion, uh, but not like a development or progression um, because we did not actively seek our space, uh, nor do we think that an online space has to be followed by a physical space, um, you know, for a uh, artist run space to be taken seriously. Um, so to be completely uh, transparent, um, our co-founder Ling Pham's family uh, gave it access to a plot of land, uh, which is luckily located in a very central location in Hanoi, and also we have like, total creative control what to do with, um, with the space. Um, so with our family support, um, the space that we have now wouldn't exist. Um, but be even before we had this, um, we were doing gatherings in, in other places. So, you know, portfolio reviews and talks, etc., at cafes or like uh, any borrowed space that we could think of, it doesn't really matter. Uh, and our past in-person in -person interaction uh, with the community has always been very casual and education focused. Um, so we would like to bring that atmosphere into this designated space. And it was built to be multifunctional. Um, so besides the ex exhibiting function, um, uh, I mean, we could do other things like workshops or panel discussions like this one. All right, and um, next I'd like to ask Nindi Yu. So you co-founded Simeti Art House in 1988 with another visual artist, Mela Yasma. What was the condition like around the time of its founding and what were your motivations for opening such a space? Yes, thank you. Hi, I'm Nindi Yu Adipurnomo. I'm a visual artist. I'm also a co-founder of Simeti. Simeti, a uh, long time ago, until the last uh, period was Timothy Art House. At the time, the world of fine arts mostly echoed from and for art schools that we as art students recognize, such as R3, you know, the academic level of fine arts, and SMSF, High School for Fine Arts in Jakarta. Though every now and then we were also surprised by information about the holding of art exhibitions in spaces managed by the cultural cooperation institution. So political art has not had political art has not had much uh, place in the way of thinking of most people. Wayang and Batik were submerged as a deep craft traditions by solemnity of the industrial economy. So the idea of artists running space that we set up was more about stimulating younger artists, most of them from the art school, to extend their paths in experimenting works and be continuously recognized by public. Imagine that at the time, working on paper was fairly provocative. So our aim was also to start having an information center for of emerging young artists and their works simply by building some kind of artist archive. That was it, yeah. And my next question for all of you, perhaps is a way to also introduce the team behind these spaces that you run, because obviously it's not a one-man show. It takes a team to both support, manage, and run the day-to-day -day operations of such a space. So perhaps starting with you, Moses, could you tell us more about the people who, have, who we have been working with to run Stutch? Yeah, so um, I think shout out to all the people that have been very generous in helping Starch. Um, we've um, so far like we've gotten interns from people who have just been very interested and involved in wanting to sort of even like you know um, help out at any point. So we have like people like um, I, I had students of mine, for example, like Sarishna, Noah. So I've known them since um, two three years back, and then like I've included them in some shows, and then they started helping out. I've also had like um, interns from LaSalle that are still coming back to help us with like different shows and all that, so like Alistair, um, and also Vance, who's actually currently helping with the Chan Davis show at Starch that's happening this month. Um, so yeah, these are the team, this is sort of like a like very loosely formed team of people that I have, and also like friends who are just 
always just like lending a like helping year, for example. My partner who helps me edit text, for example, because my tech like my writing is not the best and he's really good at it. So yeah, so far it's just like this very really loosely based, a uh, loosely formed team that I have that's working at Starch. With um, independent spaces, of course, that informal structure allows these spaces to have a fluidity, whether it comes to you know, the kind of programming or even um, just the freedom to set your own agendas, right? So um, for Hatao and Nindito, could you perhaps say a little bit more about both the people that you're working with at your respective spaces as well as the specific areas of interest that your space has? I'll like to go first. Oh, all right. I'll go first then. Um, so we have a tiny team of three people uh, working almost full time uh, on Marca. So there's me. Um, I'm the managing editor and also like program coordinator. Um, and we all, and we all like wear a lot of hats, right? And because of such a tiny team. Um, so there's Ling Pham, who is a photojournalist, and he's a co-founder. And also, like as the only designer uh, who you know, have done uh, almost all of the uh, web web design and also social media posts, um, and then there's Fong, also a, a friend photographer who helps uh, manage the space. And you know, we work together not just on Maca but also like um, in our personal and plan work as well, or related or related to photography. And of course, um, there's a network of contributors. Uh, who um, you know uh, work with me over the years um, in uh, writing articles um, and also many different other projects um, in and out of Vietnam. And um, Nin did you? Yeah, in the beginning we were uh, working with uh, with the artists as it was called uh, artist signing space. There were. Six artists included now uh, very uh, known artists. Uh, you don't know as uh, Etihara, Mira Yasma, and many others. But it uh, it lasts only for six months, and then soon we need to have an administrator and a photographer who could make a documentation. But in <coughs> in general, we uh, we did we did work with uh, well uh, we couldn't find a, 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 a curator or a, uh, art worker because it's, it's it's hard. So we always have to uh, uh, educate them or let them experience uh, by working in our gallery. So uh, we were functioning ourselves ourselves as curator, Mela and me myself. And uh, of course, we discussed it. Uh, our staff, there were six uh, staff, how to uh, design exhibition, how to select artists, and things like that. It's very much uh, fluent. And in terms of the programming of your respective spaces, I'm also just curious, how do you go about planning for your programs? And if there are people who are interested to get involved, say if they're in Singapore, they're in Hanoi, they're in Jogja, um, are you open to open calls? How does it work if people want to get involved? Perhaps Moses first. Okay, so... Um for Starch, actually, we started speaking to people first, like whoever's interested, we have this free space, come and use. Um, and then it just came about where, so I started receiving proposals, we are open to people sending in to us. Um, and then we just vet through to see whether we, th we think we can support because just, the space itself is not a very conventional white cube. So, which is why I think in terms of proposals, we tend to look out for the ones that perhaps use the space a bit differently, etc. So. Yeah, we, we, we range from like people who we speak to or like say for example myself wanting to curate something down to those who are just sending in and trying their luck and we are open to supporting a range of these programs. And Hata, I know that Matka has an open call, like on your website itself, you welcome you do welcome people to use the space for workshops, exhibition ideas and to host events. Um, if people are interested, how can they get in touch and what do you, what sort of programs do you look out for for the space? Um, so that's the open call website uh, for the space, uh, but because we are like a multi-platform project, so that gives us the flexibility um, on different ways to 
that people can collaborate with us. You know, uh, of course, we are we run a online journal as well, so we're open to receiving uh, pitches from from writers, and also it gives us this flexibility um, to not be inactive during, for example, like COVID. Uh, where you know the lockdown requires all spaces to close, and in fact, like we are still co closed right now because uh, the, the situation in Hanoi is uh, still a little bit intense. Um, but regarding how to get in touch, you know, of course, you know we are online, we are on social media and email, so we are very reachable. And in fact, um, some of our some of the most um, interesting projects for me. Uh, which is the two books that we published. Um, one is, you know, a monograph uh, of nice gaps in Hanoi, and the other is called uh, Market. It's uh, actually a history, a research project about the um, photography village um, based outside of Hanoi. So these are all projects that came from outside, it's, you know, so a writer and a photographer approach us beforehand um, at the very early beginning of, of their project and ask us to sort of um, have them develop um, the project into a publication. Um, so that's what happened. And uh, that's actually something that I look forward to all the time. And um, for me, it's a really key aspect in our work um, and also key aspect in sustainability because sometimes it's not just about finding the money but also finding new people to work with. So we don't exhaust ourselves of energy and creativity and also for the project to always feel fresh and in, keep, um, keep on running. And in Dijio, because Simeti has such a long history, it's been open for more than two decades. So I would understand that um, perhaps the circumstances have changed along the way. So um, if you could, as you answer this question, perhaps give us some kind of historical context or the background in which um, the programming has evolved over time. Yeah. Well, uh, until the first 15 years, we uh, basically exposed only solo exhibition of young artists. Uh -huh. So uh, we uh, produce 11, 10 to 11 exhibition, solo exhibition in a year. So every artist is one month show. Uh, one month show. So uh, uh, very intense. And then uh, later on, uh, we mix it with the uh, group exhibition. Uh, and then we open also we also open uh, uh, challenge the uh, the artist to do a curatorial works. So once we got uh, a good young artist in our uh, gallery, we try to repeat him or her in uh, every two years or every three years uh, for solo exhibitions. So uh, we do we do seldom a workshop because uh, uh, there was no. Uh, uh, no uh, fun for that, and yeah, we uh, <clears throat> in 2016 we started to open uh, uh, a residency. And perhaps on this note about the residency program, I like to bring the conversation towards the, um, regional kind of collaborations and partnerships that you have at these spaces, because I know that Shimati has. Uh, multiple partners that you have worked with um, in the past to host residency programs for both artists as well as curators and researchers. Um, could you talk a little bit more about these partners that you have had in the past and what makes these sorts of collaboration work for both you and your partners? Yeah. Uh the first initiation of residency was uh, uh, offered by uh, a uh, sorry uh, this uh, foundation. Uh, I forget the name of this foundation. And then we uh, uh, I'm so sorry. And then we uh, got a uh, lot of a lot of offers from the Dutch and uh, the Hague from the Hague, where they uh, offer uh, their artists, and we try to. Uh, Make it that uh, when they uh, send their artists, we uh, try to cover, to cover one uh, one Dutch artist with our local artists, and then, and so we do, we do not uh, serve them as, serve them as a as a, as a tourist, but uh, really as uh, artists in residence. And uh, it uh, developed from time to time. Uh, 
and the network uh, started to uh, develop not not only from the Dutch uh, past but also from <clears throat> uh, Australia, from uh, uh, Japan, and uh, from many others, uh, and uh, very recently also from Singapore. Yeah, and I believe one of the partners that you have in Singapore is actually Objectives, a, photograph a space that's dedicated to photography in Singapore. And um, I know, Hatao, that for Matka as well, that you have also collaborated with partners in the region. And um, one recent project would have been um, a photography show that you have participated in as part of a photo festival. Um, could you perhaps share a little bit more about this project in particular and other partners that you're working with now or in the future? Um, sorry, Ian, could you repeat the, the exhibition that you mentioned? Uh, I'm not sure which one was it. The one that happened in Cambodia as part of a oh. photo festival. Yeah. Um, so that was um, Angkor Photo Festival. And it's actually... Um, it's a festival and a um, workshop. Um, so it's a wonderful place um, that's been running for, I think, over a decade, which provides um, free education to um, Southeast, to, to Asian photographers. And it was actually the only place that I could find um, uh, to learn photography when I started out because uh, I wasn't form formally trained as a photographer. Um, and uh, after that, we were um, collaborating with them. Uh, you know, we just simply like uh, returning as uh, alumni and then um, try to get involved in the programs. Um, and um, Jessica, um, the founder who's Singaporean, but she's based in Cambodia for many, many years, um, was very supportive. And we have also, uh, actually we, we did um, collaborate with um, Objective um, as well. Um, we did a, um, a residency exchange. So, you know, one Vietnamese photographer was um, sent to Singapore and vice versa and uh, each artist uh, made work in, in their um, new location. Um, and actually Objective have, um, have been support several Vietnamese artists as well. And I felt like they are really um, the driving force between the regional connection in the art scene. And Moses, I understand that Stutch was planning some sort of program where you have artists who are not from Singapore exhibiting at the space itself, right? Could you perhaps say a little bit more about the project and what, um, of course, COVID played a role in kind of hindering some of these things from happening, yeah. So actually, I think like um, one of the collaborations we wanted to do, but right now we are also sort of like having a like this partnership with uh, Hidden Space in Hong Kong um, for the current project we're doing for Art Week, um, and we actually have a workshop in the evening later. Uh, so with Hidden Space, and also I think like we've also talked about how there's the possibility of doing a like exchange between two spaces, and also the other one which is um, later in the middle of this year, we are possibly working with. A space in Taiwan, but the like, details are not firmed yet. So, 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 like, yeah. So that's something we're working towards. But there are also artists that we wanted to work with, yeah, like from overseas. But with, um, I think one of the things that I really enjoy about the space is when artists can come in and cheat, uh, like work in the space itself. So I think it's really difficult with the lack of travel for them to actually come in. So all this have been pushed until a suitable time, which is why I think we have very flexible programming. Like if artists um, can't make it, we can at least. Like we, check, we tend to only announce our programs two weeks before the show happens so that we give that space to change if anything happens last minute, so yeah. And um, I know, of course, one of the reasons why you felt the importance of opening a space was because you really benefited from um, working at another um, artist space in Singapore, Great Projects, where you also had your first solo presentation, if I'm not wrong. So, were there any spaces in particular, whether it's in Singapore or overseas, that you felt were great models that you kind of modeled Starch after or you drew inspiration from? Yeah, I think definitely Great Projects is one of the ones that inspired me a lot. Just even with a library space, for example, like how it um, sort of allows for knowledge building, etc. So besides Grey, Hidden is one that like, um, just also because before the space was open in Hong Kong, 
um, I had really good chats with like Kay, Isabella and Katie and they were talking about how they were going to form it and this was like maybe a few years back before they opened it. So like I sort of didn't really model but rather learned from them what they did. Say for example, I think for um, Kay especially, they are very generous with the space. They give keys to the artists. If the artists need to go into the space on their own, they go on their own, which is also something we adopted where we give artists who are using the space the key to access. And so sort of like in a way we picked up little things here and there from them. But also the other things that we picked up is like say for example, how do we make it such that the space is as transformable as possible where then we do it where all the furniture can be shifted around, etc. So those are things that we sort of picked up from yeah, some of these yeah, projects per se. And in detail, uh, I'd like to ask you a little bit uh, to, to speak about this as well because um, Yogyakarta is a is an art city that's really famous for its artist-run spaces, whether it's Mass 65 or Simeti. Um, are there any spaces that you felt were inspirational or great partners um, that you worked together with? Well, uh, I think it's... Uh, uh, Indonesia is very big, yeah. <clears throat> and uh, connectivity between uh, artist-run spaces <clears throat> made easy by IT technology, convenience, uh, communication, connectedness, connectedness uh, between communities is starting, <coughs> bring up attitudes and ways to explore and connect themselves with a variety of contexts that are not always uh, referred to their local uh, context. It is a bit uh, difficult uh, for me to designate this sign it one or two ideal models of one or a few forms of artisan space. Each artisan space is, I think, trying to build connection with context, social, political, and aesthetic, I think. And Hata, uh, you mentioned objectives, but also uh, the Angkor Photo Festival, which you are an alumni. Of, um, are there any other photography spaces in the region or in Vietnam that you'd like to shout out? Um, regarding photo space in Vietnam, uh, I, I can't think of any uh, off, off the top of my head, but um, there are Manzi and Wukun 4 in Hanoi, um, two Hanoi based spaces that have been running for over a decade, uh, which is you know, quite a long time for an artist run space, um, to be honest. Um, so I look up to them a lot because they are hybrid models. Um, so Manzi runs a cafe that also serves as an art store and they also have an exhi exhibition space. Um, I was among um, the artists that received support um, from Manzi as well. And Wukun 4 is a design studio and also an art store and that sometimes uh, holds workshops. So I felt like this uh, hybrid um, flexible model um, work really well in, in, in the um, local um, in the local scene. And in terms of running a space, I think the next question I have deals really much more with the question of sustainability. How are they how do you go about sustaining the programming? And of course it takes time and labor, right? Whether they are volunteers or contributors, it takes a lot of time to both run the program and also just manage the space on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'm wondering, how do you strike the balance between perhaps the pragmatic search for sources of funding or an, and are there any principles that you would maintain and insist on as you look for these um, solutions? Perhaps you start with Moses, yeah? So I think just very um, honestly, like for our space, we haven't really apply for funding yet, just because like the space itself uh, for full disclosure is something that my parents own and we have the full use of the space. So we don't even have to ask people to pay rent. So that's on one end. Um, and also I think like on the other hand, it's like just for us, like there's also like um, to apply for funding, which means that we need to sort of start thinking about the like controlling maybe the um, perhaps the content that goes with it. And it's something that I wouldn't really want to inhibit the artists from doing. Uh, but there are shows where artists are free to apply for funding on their own. But for, I think for myself, it's just that like, if we need to sort of like straddle between both, I'd rather if there's a need to apply, it would be great to support the artists. But then if I need to sort of like, like make sure that there's a control over it, then I think I'd rather not. Although at the same time, we have a current project that I'm 
navigating uh, funding structures of at the moment. Uh, so far, it's been quite good. So I, I'm like, yeah. So I feel like I'm really co not contributing to this question as much. So I apologize first. Perhaps you could speak a bit about the show that's happening on at a. Uh at Start right now as part of Singapore Art Week because it is a collaboration with um, the Chan Davis Prize and LaSalle College of the Arts is also one of the partners that you're working with for the show. So perhaps um, you, could you talk a little bit about the premise for this show and also perhaps some of the um, things that you have to negotiate along the way? Okay, so for this, um, for the current show at Starch, which is called Sin, um, it's actually a partnership between um, Chan Hori Contemporary, and uh, which is actually um, the Chan Davis Award, and LaSalle Singapore, where they actually award a BA student and an MA student from Fine Arts um, a cash prize that they can use. So for the use of the space itself, I think also because of the pandemic, there was also like all these struggles of finding space. Like when they reached out to me, it was very easy. I just immediately said, Ken, let's do it, but I just sought out a timing for them. And in terms of, say for example, working through it, like the, what's necessary and all that is, actually to be honest, there was not much of a navigation per se. It was just quite easy. Come in, use the space to decide what you do. We can support whatever we can. Like say for example, we did the wall tags, we helped to find um, sort of the designer to do the catalog. They did the setup, they found their own engineers. Um, we, the only extra thing that we also did was just, uh, because of connections too, we, get a, we got a scaffold for them to work in the space. So yeah, it's not really that much of a negotiation, but rather just coming to terms with whichever can be done, who needs to pick up what slack, or if there's nothing that's done, then let's do something else that's help to support each other. So that's the kind of relationship that you had in terms of working for the show. All right, and for Marka, I understand that one of your recent projects is actually supported by the British Council in Vietnam. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that project and as well as the partner in the UK that you're working with? Um, well, before I go that, I'd like to um, thank Moses for your transparency and honesty. Um, I think it's, um, I, I personally very appreciate it. Uh, and I think that we, uh, you know, sh should, you know, how we finance and how we sustain our work is something that um, we should openly discuss more often. Um, actually, the, uh, I am back to your question. Um, the collaboration with um, C4 Journal, which is a UK-based um, online magazine, uh, it was supported by the British Council, and um, the, pro the proposal, the idea for the for the collaboration was initiated by us, and it was actually really nice to receive funding for a publishing project, uh, because from my experience, it's very hard to ask for funding for like writing, uh, especially you know writing. About such a niche topic such as photography, uh, it's actually a little bit easier to find um, support for um, physical events, you know, like exhibitions and workshops and so on. Um, regarding funding, I think it's really tricky because there is really no formula. Um, there's no public funding in Vietnam, so uh, I guess like everybody else, we have to apply grants um, for, for grants from international institutions. Um, sometimes, you know, um, foreign embassies based in Vietnam. Uh, but if we did have to pay rent for our space, um, then the numbers wouldn't really add up. Uh, so from very, very early on, uh, we have decided that we will not rely on MACDA to pay the bills, even though like the work here sometimes requires more than a full-time job. Um, and the reason why is that we don't want to put ourselves um, in a spot where our independent position is compromised, so very, very much similar to Moses. Um, and even with projects supported by the third parties, you know, like um, the publishing project that uh, that is supported by the British Council, um, we have to make sure that the content comes from us or is in line with our principles. Uh, and, and in fact, like um, we have declined um, offers to work with big name institutions in the past. Um, when we feel like our voices are really being heard or that, you know, our presence as a alternative art space is tokenized. Um, so, yeah. Um, what about you, Ninitio? Um, throughout the history of Shimeti, did you observe perhaps any kind of changes in terms of different um, non-governmental organizations approaching 
your space and to fund certain projects or did you feel the need to actively seek out sources of funding from these um, NGOs? Yeah, uh, within the first uh, 15 years, uh, when we were uh, organizing solar exhibitions every month, we were very much dependent on uh, sales, actually. Uh, people often think that we are not commercial gallery, but in fact, we are selling artworks in, in a way that, that we were not looking for uh, commercial artworks. But uh, somehow we managed to sell uh, some artworks, and it really depends on the sales. Uh, uh, sometimes when we did organize a group show uh, in another city, then we tried to work with uh, uh, the local institution to sponsor us. Yeah, well, well we, are, we try to work very, uh, very uh, low budget. Uh, we already have space, a physical building, you know, that must be uh, sufficient uh, commensurate with the portion of our activity so that we are not burdened by the cost of renting spaces and so on. We are very careful in cal and cal very much calculate. For example, the cost of producing uh, art creation by office, we don't automatically take into account and adapt proposals for the, for the cost of producing works from, from each artist. But also, not all of us we take. We are just very careful because the financial support for the production of creation for artists will not necessarily ease the work of artists instead of lightening, lightening it. It can often lead them to creative property of creation, which has an impact on the low autonomy and independence of their artistic explorations. That's why one really actually depends on a uh, fund when we started to open up uh, this uh, residency because this uh, Dutch uh, institution, uh, this Arctic Den Haag in the Hague, offer this uh, uh, residency program. And then we start to look for uh, funding uh, from uh, Erasmus House in Jakarta and many other uh, cultural institutions in, uh, in Indonesia. In the time, we politically, we didn't want to uh, deal with directly with the current government regime. We don't even want to know whether to use some kind of government aid or not at the time. Um, before but I now, ask uh, the next... Uh, it's now uh, 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 shifting a bit. It's now uh, we are uh, we are very much actually uh, uh, very much depending on uh, on uh, fun uh, instead of uh, selling artworks. So we do sell very uh, seldom artworks uh, the last five years, the last uh, ten years, and instead we are looking for a lot of uh, funding. I think it's quite surprising that you mentioned that for the first 15 years, Symmetry was run um, from the proceeds of the sale of yeah. artworks. Because it's something that's quite unexpected because you often and, um, kind of associate artist-run spaces as being very different from commercial entities or um, kind of institutionalized education settings. But I just want to dwell with your at, at Symmetry for a while because I'm so curious to ask what's who are these um, kind of clients or collectors who bought that works in the first 15 years? Because this was very much pre-internet and perhaps we're not as interconnected as we are right now. Are they mostly yeah, kind of and, local uh, collectors? It, really, yeah, it was really funny because we, uh, we were pretty much accepted by uh, expatriates. You know, uh, at the time there were a lot of uh, uh, European, Australian, uh, American expatriates living in Jakarta. And they were very much appreciating our uh, our gallery, and uh, as they also need uh, something to hang in their house. Uh, and it it worked for some for some years actually. And uh, that was funny enough that these expatriates introduced also their say the taste of the uh, they make a kind of a, a promotion to uh, the local uh, to the local buyer who started to uh, to come and. And buy artwork in Germany. It was very things, yeah. Until uh, the boom started, actually, we were very much uh, uh, dependent on uh, uh, expatriates from all over Indonesia. 
And perhaps on the topic of like selling work and expatriates in a particular community, I know from our um, earlier conversations with you, Hatao, uh, that you do have um, perhaps the reason, one of the reasons why you started Matka was to create a platform and then also perhaps um, provide some education for um, the type, different types of photography that exist. So perhaps something that the type of works that you are, um, your space is more invested in is slightly different from the types of commercial photography or kind of tourist um, maroon, um, kind of souvenirs that are on sale around um, perhaps Hanoi, for example. Could you perhaps say a little bit more about this topic, about um, what the, the question of fine art photography and writing about photography Um, I'm actually very jealous uh, hearing that Nitio was able to fund, um, you know, his space with, uh, you know, selling artworks, even though like they don't really fall into the category of like um, easy to sell works. Uh, let's uh, just leave it at that. Um, we, to be completely honest, um, we have done a couple of exhibitions, but we haven't been able to sold a lot of um of, of, of prints um, for various reasons, right? Because um, um, photography, well, first of all, isn't as widely accepted as a form of art yet um, because it's a re relatively new medium and um, people here aren't as used to collecting prints as they were um, to, you know, like um, unique pieces such as paintings or sculptures. Um, and this, um, I guess, I mean, like we've always had this objective of elevating photography as a form of visual art, and it's even becoming more evident to us now. Um, we wouldn't really keen on um, like dividing photography into genre. Uh, so this is fine art, this is documentary, this is fashion. Um, for, for me personally, these labels don't really make sense. And, you know, nowadays we, you know, the lines aren't as, you know, clear cut. Um, but for me, uh, I was simply interested in the kind of photography that reflects a, a personal vision and also like um, um, that can express the photographer's um, personal observation and point of view and also aesthetic. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm interested in. And um, my next question actually looks a little bit more at the idea of longevity of art spaces. So I know for one that M Moses, when you first opened Starch, you really only conceived of it as like a one year long project, right? But now it's in its second year of operation. So could you say a little bit more about why you had this initial idea and what changed your mind? Yeah, so in seven days, we're going to first well, celebrate our first um, birthday at Starch. Uh, but in any case, so yeah, so when I first conceived it, that's what Ian mentioned is that I imagine it as a one-year project just because, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure what my personal capacities would be, what my limitations might be. So I thought, okay, just let, let's just do it one year first and then going in and winging it for a year kind of thing. Um, I was just trying my best. It was a huge learning curve. And I think at the end, when, um, like in the midst of it, when I was doing it, realizing that there's, there's actually quite a lot of need for space. There's also people who wanted to play with things, like the space itself also provided a lot of um, opportunities for experimentation. So in the midst of it, when I was doing it, I was like, oh, actually, yeah, this space actually could be bigger than what it is. So why not let's just, you know, like push it further. So, so far, we've actually, um, our schedule is actually full all the way to December this year. And um, yeah, so I just think that at the end of the day, like when a need arises, I'm happy to support. We're happy to support as such. So yeah. And did you? I understand that you're not that involved in the day-to-day -day operations of Sumeti today. It's been handed over to a team and sort of um, institutionalized, perhaps in a way. Could you talk a little bit more about um, perhaps your relationship to Sumeti today and what were what was that transition like for you, giving? over, um, handing over the organization to a new team? Yeah. Uh, the most uh, very uh, important issue was how to to find a curator. Uh, 
look, uh, we really started as an uh, artist running space. So we assume that we understand uh, artist problem. So we uh, easily uh, uh, can go with, uh, with the, the artist. But then we have to open it to uh, non artist. Uh, it was a, really a problem. Uh, then we start to really think of who will be the manager, who will be the curator, and uh, who will be the staff and everything. It was really not easy for us to do that. And uh, yeah, uh, we uh, went through a uh, lot of uh, struggle and, and uh, trial, and uh, uh, we, are, we are happy that uh, now it's, uh, it's taken by a group of young, young people who were not who are not artists at all. They, uh, they, uh, they were trained in our, uh, in our gallery and they uh, are uh, very much interested into uh, cultural studies and this method. So uh, it may change into a kind of uh, 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 cultural, uh, what is it called? An uh, NGO or something. <clears throat> With, as long as they, uh, uh, as long as we can see that they, they are really uh, stimulating the growing of artists, I think we were just fine. We now uh, acting as a kind of a board, uh, advisory board with many other uh, names such as Alia Swastika and uh, Epic Sarsono, who's artist, you know, and uh, uh, Jonet, who's form, forming artist. So, <clears throat> yeah, but actually we, uh, as, a, as a board, as an advisory board, we, uh, I would say we do not really function well. It's more like that we are uh, partners as uh, uh, for discussion and things like that. You know, so uh, it's not really uh, uh, run by these uh, young young people. It's it's not it's no more uh, artist running space actually. I would, I would I would say I I think it's very important to really underline what uh, what it is uh, artist running space. Yeah. <clears throat> And for Matka, did you conceive of it as a, a project that would span over a specific duration? How, how, how did your kind of conception of Matka perhaps evolve, especially as you open a physical space? Um, to be completely honest, uh, there's really no master plan. Um, so we sort of like just grow along. Uh, we would... Um, Um, I mean, longevity is something that really matters to me. Um, and in fact, seeing many artists run spaces slowly disappearing, like even before COVID, it was kind of disheartening to me um, because uh, I felt like I lost a, a part, of, you know, like of the soul of the city, right? And uh, also I feel kind of sorry for the um, younger generation who wouldn't have this opportunity to be in these same spaces uh, as I did. Uh, and so with Matka, um, even though, you know, for me, like a physical space is not a must have, it's something that is nice to have, but it's definitely not a must have. Uh, it's still nice, you know, to be, to have a space where you can gather people and where you have this in-person interaction and where a lot of learning happen, a lot of, you know, friendships uh, develop. Um, Oh, and for me, it's, um, I mean, even though like there's really no master plan, it's something for us um, that is very closely tied to our own practice. So, you know, we are like working for TOEFLs and even though with Marka, our role expands um, to, you know, curators or sometimes writers and coordinators and things like that. But at the end of the day, I see um, the development of Matka um, directly affects my, um, my practice. And I felt like I've grown, um, you know, as an artist as well by doing this um, small little things, you know, day-to-day -day operation and meeting new people, uh, knowing about their problems and, and maybe getting involved, you know, with developing their projects. Thank you for bringing up that point because it's a perfect segue to my next question. And I really want to highlight the fact that each of you are all practicing artists in your own right. And 
opening a space or running a space is almost like a second full-time job for each of you. And um, my next question actually is about if, you, if your perception of your own artistic practice has changed since getting involved in running an independent space, because of course it entails many different roles, whether it is curating, writing, um, event organizing, fundraising, or even being a representative or spokesperson for your respective communities. So perhaps, Moses, I'll start with you. Has, did, did, you ha, did your perception of your own practice change, or did, perhaps has running starched also introduced you to different approaches of art making, for example? Like, I think, like, okay, right now, to be honest, I haven't really had much thought given that with just really coming close to one year, I haven't really like sat down to like, okay, how does it feel? But I would definitely say that intrinsically I felt that like things have changed for me. Like I felt that like as an artist, like um in terms of like and I think I also appreciate what um Hata was saying about how like the friends that you make in running. And I feel that like with that I've started you know, meeting different people and meeting these people are the ways in which has also changed orientated or reorientated my practice myself. Um, and I think that is something that has come with building a space, building a community, and that like for myself also in terms of even the space and in terms of running the space, like it was just, it was a huge learning curve. Like for myself, like I started having to learn how to think about budgeting, writing, for example, promoting, marketing, etc. And those are things that I think also, which are sort of like hidden labors of being an artist that I find that because of this running of this space, I'm like okay now I know how to better handle some of these things that I need to do. So, yeah, I guess on the other outside packaging thingy, if that makes sense, um, I've definitely changed in terms of my practice. And in terms of also even, like, because I've also running the space, I've also, like, imagined how the space would look like if I could play with it. And that in itself also has allowed me to go, like, okay, can I, like, now let's think about what do I do, what do I make next? Nindip, I, like I really want to ask, um, perhaps invite you to answer this question along the tangent of thinking about the professionalization of being a contemporary artist, especially in um, your context. Could you speak to that as you answer the question? Yeah, well, it was really uh, helpful I and mean, fruitful to uh, run such as uh, whatever you call run, uh, uh, art space or gallery. In fact, we were practicing uh, uh, you know how how you understand uh, artist process, uh, you know, and then you share, you discuss with more artists, and then you present it, and then you get a uh, lot of uh, response of criticism from the public, and then awareness, the awareness of uh, building a kind of uh, 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 no, not community, but uh, certain public that you uh, always try to. Uh, to keep uh, understanding your work, and so uh, it was very, uh, very much fruitful. Uh, uh, I sometimes I uh, look at the uh, gallery as a kind of museum, so uh, I always uh, <clears throat> eating with uh, museum programs every day, uh, which is not happen to any other people, you know. Uh, so you always deal with artworks. You, uh, it, I think, it was just very good, and. Uh, uh, until we uh, uh, came to the idea to set up a uh, center of uh, uh, documentation for uh, visual artists, which is now IFA, Indian Visual Art Archive. It was also uh, <coughs> very much uh, inspired by the idea. Uh, we uh, also came up with uh, the idea of uh, uh, building a very simple artist archive. There was no uh, no understanding of what is what is that artist archive. Until now, uh, we uh, uh, make it into a center of uh, research uh, by using this uh, archive. You know. So uh, just the whole thing, the whole uh, team, is, is, it was just just uh, good. But no, I'm I'm also missing a, a period. But I'm I'm not trying to leave all these uh, institutional things because it it is. I realize it, it, it's very much um, management, very much managerial. So I just want to be, uh, now I'm, I'm trying to uh, be more and more working as, a, as an artist. I don't care with the management anymore. So it's also uh, a new form for me. Yeah. 
And Hatao, personally for you, how did you feel that, um, how, how did you, perhaps, could you speak, um, perhaps give a, a few examples of how you felt that your practice has grown or matured since um, getting involved with Maka? Um, since, um, for me, it's, everything is pretty new. Um, and, you know, I'm also like a young person, a young artist. So uh, I, I'm not really sure if there's a solid example or I don't even know how to like articulate <laughs> this experience. But for me, working at Maka, like in, in particular, working with my colleagues who are working uh, photographers, uh, it's very important for me to be immersed in an environment where um, we would spend hours looking at photography or, you know, discussing various aspects of the medium, sharing um, professional experiences, um, things like that. Because um, I didn't receive formal training as an artist or a photographer for that matter. Um, so for me, this is like my own way of education, um, at least less formal, but also more well-rounded and more connected to this locality that I'm in. Right, we're one hour into our conversation already. And um, at this point, I really like to remind both our audiences who are attending the program in person as well as joining us online that we are re um, open to questions. So please um, do scan the Slido QR code and send us any questions that you might have. Um, I will begin actually going through some of the questions because we've got some really brilliant questions on Slido right now. Um, and I think let's start with one that's a little bit um, more speculative. So someone asked, if you received a big financial grant, how would you use it? Moses? I guess it's dependent on like what the, okay, so to be honest, like this is speculative, but then there's also like, I'm sure there are definitely different boundaries that are tied to this grant. And like, but if I were to imagine this one is like no, like no, tie, strings, no attached. strings attached and all that, then I think for me, it's just to center back to the artist, if I could give it back to the artist first, those who need the space, who need the funds to produce and make. And if I could imagine or dream a dream project, for example, for Starch, I would possibly maybe do an open call or a series of open calls that people can use. Um, and then they'll actually get a grant for each show, for example, and to use the space, but then to use the money to actually fund their own production, for example. So I guess, yeah, I hope that's what I will do. Lah. Much going into the production of both the exhibition and commissioning of new works, perhaps. Yes, correct, yeah. And what about for you, Hatao or Nindidio? If, you, if your kind of space received a huge financial grant with no strings attached, how would you use it? Um, I think it would be, it would be really nice um, to not have to take on client work. Uh, <laughs> because uh, that's something that um, even though like I'm very grateful for work, right? Uh, and also sometimes it's nice to get out of the art circle for a while. Um, it can be a little exhausting um, and overwhelming to try to juggle, you know, different tasks and being, being in different head spaces. So having that extra, um, you know, that financial security to not have to worry about that is something really nice. And I feel like, uh, because I'm not there yet, <laughs> I'm not, um, I'm not really sure, you know, what will happen if I get to that point. Uh, but I think I would do something similar to Moses, that is, you know, to send, you know, to, to sort of um, distribute the, the funding to um, local artists. Um, because I felt like the, the fact that um, photography struggles to retain its existing practitioners uh, and also like feels it's very hard to like attract new talent um, is because of the lack of uh, educational and professional opportunities. Um, so um, there is still, you know, artists still struggle to um, find a place to study or to show their work and um, they struggle to sustain their practice. So at a certain point they would leave <laughs> They would leave, you know, photograph photography to to do other things to support themselves, and I felt like that's the the biggest struggle um, that we have right now. Uh, that you know, we as artists and also like as an, a space have right now, when um, there is only so much we could do, right? You know, when um, when you know the whole scene is um, 
you know, struggling with um, sustainability. And in the two? Yeah, I wish, I wish I will get not only uh, uh, funds, money, but also uh, when it is not pandemic now. I think uh, I'm really uh, uh, dreaming when it is not pandemic, I would uh, continue further with the uh, residency program. I think it's very important for me personally to really uh, make an uh, exchange uh, in between artists. Uh, in the, in, the, in, the, in the region or internationally, it's, it's really very important. I, uh, I do not I think uh, directly to uh, keep money to the uh, production cost of the output, because I uh, understand that uh, it's, it's very hard to really uh, uh, measure that, you know, uh, it really depends on the creativity. So uh, you, cannot, you cannot really uh, make a uh, uh, certain standard of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, financing uh, this production cost of the artist. So rather than uh, stimulating artist production, uh, artwork production, I would uh, like to do uh, more uh, workshop uh, for the artist uh, project or certain project based on a, a certain research or something like that. So uh, yeah, but this pandemic makes it really very difficult. I, I don't know. That was my, uh, my uh, dream. We have another question, and the person is asking, what do you enjoy most about the work you do? Which I think is the easy part of the question. The second part goes, um, what do you enjoy least and wish someone else could come in to do on your behalf? Anyone? <laughs> I think I'll go first. I think like, okay, I'm thinking about the things that I enjoy. I actually enjoy a lot of the aspects of it. Uh, like the managing down to curating down to um, sometimes even cleaning just because also I'm not very, I'm a very messy person. So then there's this space that I need to take be responsible for so I need to clean it. Um, so yeah, but in terms of like maybe something that I would wish someone could help with is perhaps to sometimes manage the space, manage like what people are doing, I guess, like just because like, the physical management is something that I can't be there often. So I think just for myself, I would wish for someone to really help physically manage the space. So yeah. And for Hata, what, what about you? Are there perhaps any professional expertise that you feel that Marka could really benefit from as well as you think about this question? Well, similar to Moses, um, I also have a love-hate relationship with uh, um, like being involved with every single aspect of our day-to-day -day operation. Uh, and it does, in fact, like take, time, take the time and mental space away from, uh, you know, my own practice. Uh, and even though, you know, now we just, I'm just, you know, trying to go with the flow and try to, um, and to do my best. Um, I would really appreciate if uh, someone could come in and help that. Yeah. And, you know, like I already mentioned about the, the past that I enjoyed about, you know, like running this space because obviously um, I feel like it's, it's such a luxury and a privilege to have the time and space dedicated to um, photography like this. Um, what about you, Nindityo? Yeah, well... Uh, I'm, I'm, I think I'm coming from my origin. I'm, I'm an artist. I'm still I'm practicing a lot as, a, as an artist. So I'm, I'm also working a lot with uh, artisans and many of them uh, mostly also uh, craftsmen. Then I got in, in touch with them. Uh, and uh, in the beginning, I'm acting like, you know, uh, the one who uh, has got uh, too much idea, too much so you know, you know uh, and then you start to uh, to collaborate together, and then uh, you uh, realize that he or she is coming, and and, and then uh, really uh, in the end uh, really interact your ideas and then, uh, discuss a lot, and then uh, and then you start to see him or her as also as artist. That that was very uh, very uh, beautiful moment for me. It was really uh, when I. 
I don't care uh, the result of my work, but I uh, I care uh, contact uh, the discussion with these people. I think. And oh, talking about. Uh, can I add something? Because <laughs> we just yes. uh, happened to. Yeah. Um, there's one aspect that I particularly don't enjoy. Um, that is to having to ask for permission from local authorities anytime we show something or anytime we try to publish uh, a print publication. Uh, and even though it's a uh, you know procedure very specific to Vietnam, and even though it's been um, I mean, like the local authority, I felt like, you know, they're trying to, to be open, to, to be more open than they were, um, let's say, 10 years ago regarding um, the censorship of, of contemporary art. Um, just having to go through that procedure itself is quite, um, you know, it's, uh, for, first of all, it's time consuming. And secondly, it can be quite, um, what's the word, like, um, it can be quite tiring. Um, having to go through that and sometimes having to, if it goes smoothly, then great. But if it doesn't, then, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't think, you know, any artist uh, or any curator enjoys um, having to explain themselves in the work. Um, so uh, yeah, that's, um, that's something that um, I know I have to accept as reality, but I wish that I, that I didn't. Moses, do you, you want to add something? No, actually, for me, it was just like a little, like on hindsight thing, like when I was thinking about Free Toilets, I was just reminded of a memory where one of the shows we had, which is by Chai Ting and Li Ling. And, as that, and the thing is, I think, like, which I really do feel heartened about is when, like, you know, the space itself has become a community where people going in, they take care of the space very well. So Chai Ting and Li Ling. So we actually had an issue with the toilet and then like the artist actually cleaned the toilet very well and I felt so bad about it. So it was just an on hindsight thing like yes, have to remember to credit them for that. So yeah, that's all. And I think I, I would like to perhaps dwell a little bit more about what you brought up, Hatao. And there's a related question that um, someone has asking and they asked for anyone who's thinking of opening and running a space like yours, what do you think they should know or consider before doing so? And perhaps... I would like to invite each of you to answer this question within the context of the city that you're based in. Yeah, maybe Hatao, you would like to go first? Um, oh, I felt like you have to be um, financially ready and also like having someone like, you know, at least one person or a team if you can gather enough people to be with you um, and to support you along the way because it's definitely something that you couldn't do alone. Um, for me, um, maybe artist run spaces uh, have a short life cycle, right? And maybe the goal of artist run spaces isn't to exist as long as possible because uh, in, at the end of the day, it's not like a survival game, uh, but losing spaces doesn't mean losing people. Um, for me, even though like we have seen the loss of um, many important um, independent art centers, for example, uh, Hanoi Dog Lab or Heritage Space or Nya San Collective in Hanoi. Uh, there is Sun Art in Ho Chi Minh City um, that has you know, lost its space and moved to a different location multiple times during uh, the course of 10 years. But for me, like losing the space, it doesn't mean the end of the world, right? <laughs> because the artists still live and the art still live on and vice versa. Uh, you know, if a space uh, exists without the people who run it, without the people who make up the, the soul of the space, then, uh, you know, it's just empty. Okay, I think like, yeah, so similar to what Hada was saying, just to echo that, that like, um, there's also the need to first consider the financial part of it. Um, and I will also admit that I'm at a point of privilege where I can share the privilege first as an artist to share the space with people and all that. Um, just because the cost of running it can be like sometimes like quite strenuous if you need to sort of like think about like budgeting every month, for example, 
Um, and I have the privilege to not like think too much of it. We have funds for, like, I have my own fund to pay out my own pocket for certain things, but not for everything, for example. Um, but I think the other part that I want to just mention um, is that I feel that like, there's a need to then be aware of the very different facets of like exhibition making or managing, for example. And I think my own experience was because like, I was teaching, for example, in LaSalle for a while, and I also had to help with student shows and like, learn how to set up, for example. Um, I also saw like, different, how people actually sort of, like, did their own programming, marketing, etc. So I think for me, it's just um, being able to be aware of what these different points might be first, before, and for me, that's I think something that I, I sort of like made sure that I was quite aware of before I started thinking about the space. It's just that, okay, what are the different things that need to be done? How do people do it? What do we do? What are the different models that people are playing with? Uh, how do you imagine the space? What are the rules? How do you think about creating? And I think for me, at the end also, how do I create a safe space for someone, for example? Um, just because that then, like, with that safe space, what do I think, like, um, so there's one of the things that I've picked up from, um, I think, when I was doing residency in Santa Fe, and they were talking about how do you build a queer safe space, for example. And some of the things I like, say, for example, if you need to have a sort of like community agreement before people go into the space, for example, is that something you do, et cetera. So those are different sort of like points of knowledge that I learned about before even starting the space. So I'm just thinking, is that actually a very perhaps pertinent thing to think about? Um, the question of bring, creating a safe space is actually one of the questions that somebody asked. And I think, Moses, do you have anything more that you'd like to add on that topic? Um, I think, like, okay, so one of the things that I also do in the space is, like, um, where to create a safe space is just if I needed to, how do, like, different people who are in the space know when to guide people. So say, for example, if I need to guide someone to somewhere safe immediately at the point of time, um, how do I make sure that I can segregate them. So I think that's something that I wanted to say. I'm putting it in very um, abstract terms, but I think if anyone's interested, like, we can talk about it in detail later on. Lah. All right, and for you, what about you, for you, Nindityo? Are there any, perhaps, um, rules or specificities of running and sustaining an artist space in Jogja? Yeah, well, on top of the... Uh financial uh, issues. Uh, I think I would have a uh, very important uh, thing is that uh, social capital, as well as the cultural capital, you have to uh, have that. You can start to build that uh, before you finally uh, really need the financial uh, capital, I think. And uh, artist initiative is uh, really for me, it really depends on how, how strong or how impactful uh, uh, your initiative will be. I think that's important. Uh, you don't think about uh, long uh or anything like that. But, uh, as long as you offer something very uh, uh, impactful, uh, that is that must be the number one request. I think. And are there any qualities, perhaps, that you felt that, um, or things that came along the way that you attribute to the reason why Simeti could last and flourish for more than 20 years? Yeah, well, uh, uh, luckily, Simeti uh, lives much longer <coughs> than any other artist time space. And somehow, we found out its importance to always. Uh, to always uh, go along with uh, social change. I, think. I remember that we often confronted by question of what is your, what is our criteria, uh, uh, criteria or management uh, policies. And we cannot, we always cannot provide a definitive answer unless that we have been changing or from time to time. Yeah. Uh, if compare with uh, uh, Black December or Krakan uh, Paru, which is a uh, new art movement from the 70s. Uh, they were more, uh, you know, uh, artist movement. They really uh, stick out with a powerful voice. Uh, so uh, even if they are short-lived, it was also very important, I think. Uh, I, I don't think if Long City is, it depends on how you, uh, how, how you look at uh, actually, yeah. 
And um, perhaps we'll, I'll bring up another two more questions before we close off for this afternoon. Um, the next one is something that Hatao you kind of brought up a little bit earlier on. And the question goes, um, space is a luxury and independent spaces come and go. So does your space die without its physicality? Can it be reconceptualized in other ways, perhaps digitally? And I think Marka is in a very unique position um, with regards to this question, is there anything else that you would like to add? Um, well, for me, even though you know um, a physical space is something that is that looks you know quite impressive, right? Because it has this physicality in it, and of course, you know um, it has its unique um, qualities. Uh, you know, you can bring people in, you can do things with the word space, and etc. The digital space is something that, you know, we started out with and it's something that, um, and it's something that, um, I mean, it's not that we, we stop um, publishing altogether, you know, even though it's um, kind of, um, as I said, um, because, you know, we are running different projects at a time, then we aren't able to publish just as much. But for me, um, like, the digital space is a lot easier to maintain. So it has this, you know, sustainability aspect to it. And also at the same time for me, um, writing is some like, is a long lasting medium. Um, and I see myself um, feeling encouraged to create something of value. Um, so we have had this objective from very early on, but now it's even like becoming more clearer to me, um, we just to focus more on long form, uh, well research pieces uh, that offer a wide variety of perspectives on photography, like including the ones that might not be familiar to the local Vietnamese audiences, uh, but still are in, important to be exposed to. And of course, you know, our website was published, you know, almost 300 um, pieces in the past, and it's, it's like an, an archive in the making. And for you, Nindityo, what do you think about the physicality of a space? And perhaps, do you think there are particular qualities or things that are lost without a physical presence? Um, what opportunities does the digital platform perhaps offer, Simeti? Yeah, uh, about the physical space. Well, this is a typical question that arises uh, from the dumps and uh, ambiguity of the uh, millennial generation in the last 10 years, I think. Am I right? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm trying to explain it without uh, getting caught up in uh, the dichotomy of our perceptions, our per perceptions and our interpretation of space, both physical and non-physical. Using physical space is managing, in, in, in managing artist learning space, <laughs> whether they own permanently or just rented, still very relevant, I think. In the era of uh, communication technology where they are constantly back and forth movement between virtual space and <clears throat> physical space continues. So artists are not required to not only get used to it by experiencing, but understanding how the idea of, I think, the idea of distortion takes place and shapes its meaning. It is precisely at this time that reality is increasingly defined through the image of the surface on a plane mirror on this. Physical space could references for artists to define reality with all initial understanding of, of the series of distortions. That's my, uh, my idea. Uh, I, I don't want to uh, make a, a, a dichotomy between physical and uh, virtual space. I think it, it is uh, something you uh, need both. Yeah, so I think like for myself also, like for starch, like although on the first hand, like when we started it, like I think starch itself was the, the physicality of it was like something that uh, was redrawn really to like um, just because also the height the artist can actually play with um, something that is like maybe bigger and all that. 
but I guess also at the same time, like um, there are ideas, and I say ideas because they are not full set plans yet, but ideas to sort of bolster our digital platform a bit more, um, just to see that in future, because we never know what will happen, and that if that is so, then it can start still also be a digital platform for people to use to sort of like be supported with, for example. So it's something that we're still thinking about. Um, so yeah, I'm not saying I'm not really answering. I'm just saying that like we are so, have plans to do both, lah. And um, I think the final question to just close off today's discussion is: um, Could you, could either each of you share the most memorable or rewarding project that has happened at your respective spaces? Yeah, perhaps we start with you, Moses. Um, yeah, so I think um, a lot of the projects that have happened have been amazing. But I think I would just also mention, the, like, I think for me, maybe the most memorable might be the one also that I'm also involved in more because like, there are shows that are amazing, but I'm not involved. So I guess in those experiences, it's a bit different. So I think the one that uh, I remember most was um, Inheritance of Parts, um, and that was happening in August. Eh, was it August or October? I can't remember uh, the month. October, yes. So, um, Inheritance of Parts was a show where we was working with like um, different people, like Irfan Kasman. We had um, Rose Maini Buang. We also had like Zachary Chan and um, Eric Lee, and also we had uh, yeah. So, it's in, in terms of the show, oh, and Marsha Ong, sorry. So, in terms of the show, what we did was we actually came together. We read a text together, and then um, everybody came in with what they wanted to play with, and then. The show itself also, why I remember it most is because of the fact that there was so much generosity involved. People were coming in, they were just like not expecting to be treated in a way. They just came in, okay, you want to take this space, you take this space, you want to take this space, you want to take this space. And it was just held together where we came in with a mindset that let's just have fun, do something good, make a good show, for example. And this was something that was not like planned like super properly. Even like we had performance and activation site. It was even the last minute, like, okay, what are we doing today? What are we going to do right now? So... That kind of energy, which is quite organic, is something that I um, will remember it for, and which is why I'm remembering it to today. Lah. And for you, Hatao, what is the most memorable or rewarding project that you have worked on? Um, it's actually very hard to choose, um, but if I have to pick one, then um, it's our upcoming book. Um, it's, it's not released yet. It's supposed to release last year, but uh, because you know we have long lockdowns um, due to COVID, so... Um, it's going to be like after Lunar New Year, but uh, to give a brief introduction, it's, um, you know, it's a uh, making books is something that we've always, we've been doing and always love to do more. Um, simply because, you know, I'm such a fan of print and photo books and things like that. Uh, but at the same time, I felt like it's a very suitable form um, to present this um, collection of several photographic works that um, I've always, always loved, uh, but uh, isn't widely shared uh, with the, you know, like the wider community, simply because um, it's something that happens to a lot of amazing works uh, done by Vietnamese photographers, uh, because they fail to um, give a form to it. Uh, and it's just, you know, lying in hardware, and, and, you know, in their laptop computer somewhere. Uh, without uh, being seen and uh, it's it's really quite a shame so um, with this upcoming um, photo book project I've been able to um, to first of all like secure funding for it and to um, pay everyone uh, a small artist fee so that they would um, revise the project or develop it we are also commissioning new work and you know like a new article and in this um, upcoming project like my role, I actually don't have really a big role here at all, other than um, just to well, secure funding and connecting people and sort of uh, have them, um, you know, aid them in, um, in making the, the final form of the work. And so, yeah, it's, uh, it's been a really rewarding experience to, um, to be involved in something um, quite artistically rigorous like this. And for you, Nindichu, this is a difficult one for you because Simeti has been running for more than 30 years. But please, um, yeah, name one memorable or rewarding project in the last 30 years. In the last 30 years, my God. Yeah, I, I, got, I got it already. Uh, it was called uh, Soto Participante Project. It was uh, done in 2013, uh, a year-long year -long, year -long project where we 
uh, get with uh, many other artists from many different mediums, uh, music composer, musician, uh, uh, writers, and uh, poets, and many, and even um, new uh, artists, and visual artists, and well, many. And we uh, uh, try to understand each other by uh, uh, every uh, week we uh, visit their studio, and each artist uh, will uh, share ideas about their work because we believe that artists will be very much uh, uh, a lot of uh, yeah very much open <coughs> to talk about their work when they are in the studio, and then <coughs> we uh, continue with uh, uh, us each of them to uh, select any other artist in Indonesia that they want to uh, know more. And then they must do a kind of a research on each artist they select. And the, 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 uh, the research is uh, also open that every month we have to uh, get a presentation of each development of, of the research until uh, become an, a certain idea that they, uh, in the end, they uh, each of us uh, uh, make an artwork out of that uh, research uh, result. It was a very, very, uh, very nice project, a, a year long. All right, and I think with that, we have come to the end of the session today. I really like to thank um, our three speakers, Moses, Hatal, and Nditio for having um, sharing your experiences and being so open about um, how running an artist run space has affected both your practice as well as the communities that you are um, working with. And I really want to invite audiences both um, in person with us here as well as joining us digitally and also watching the um, playback of Saw Digital, um, Saw Dialogues online at a later point to really check out each of these spaces and see how perhaps you can contribute or um, be a part of these communities and also support the cultural life uh, in your local cities. So thank you very much and I'll hand over the time to Vivian. Thank you to everyone for spending the afternoon with us today and thank you to our moderator Ian and our panelists Moses, Hatao and Inditio for the conversation. If you'd like to find out more about all the talks in SAW Dialogues 2022, please scan the QR code on the screen now. All recordings of our past talks are available for viewing and SAW Digital. Do also look out for the summaries of each panel that will be released on artandmarket.net where we share key takeaways. Before you go, we would also like to invite you to complete a survey towards improving the program for the next Singapore Art Week. I'll give you a moment to scan the QR code on screen. When you have completed the survey, you can also take a screenshot of the submission page and show it to the info booths at Gilman Barracks at Blocks 9 and 47 to collect complimentary SAW 2022 merchandise. SAW Dialogues 2022 is presented by Art & Market in partnership with National Arts Council Singapore. See you tomorrow.